Is anybody listening? Mm -hmm. I wonder, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. A voice in the wilderness. Uh -huh. I wonder. Peace, shalom, this is Brother Dawa, Ben Yisrael. I'm your host for this segment of the Yaz Real Hour, September 15th, 2013. I want to start first off by acknowledging what took place 50 years ago this day at a church in Alabama. Four young girls, black or indigenous young girls, lost their lives because of racial hatred. Uh, you know, you have to pay homage to our ancestors. Those young girls are ancestors now, but they've not been forgotten. And it's ironic, interesting that uh, 2020 and ABC is here today. Uh, I have a guest as well. On this particular day, 50 years later, and we're still discussing race. And it's, to me, it seems as if it hasn't gotten any better, especially for those of us who are considered to be black people today. But anyway, the name of this show is Nationalism 2013. And as I said, I do have a guest. This is a live call-in show as well. The number that I can be reached at, 312-738-1845. 312-738-1845. You can call in and voice your opinion, be it a yay or a nay. Uh, hopefully we can keep the uh, tensions down. I know that the world is hot right now as far as race and racism and it seems that things are bubbling up again on the surface of this this country as, as well as even the planet and um, the things that it seems that our people tried to institute back during the civil rights movement it seems to me that uh, we're going in reverse and the powers that be want to take us back to a place that we used to be when we couldn't drink out of a water fountain that a European drank out of. Or when we had the Black's Code laws on the books, we couldn't do what Europeans were allowed to do. It seems to me that they're trying to take us back to that place and almost, if not, uh, institute uh, physical slavery again. But uh, of course, that will not be. I just don't think that the higher power is going to allow such a thing. And I have with me, as I said, a guest, Matthew Heimbach, who is a white nationalist. Is that correct? Yeah, I would identify as a white nationalist. Okay. So why don't you just introduce yourself to uh, the guest? Sure. I believe that's your camera right there. There we go. Well, my name is Matthew Heimbach. Um, I'm the national director of the Traditionalist Youth Network, which is an organization that is designed to have white student unions across this country and to get young people of uh, high school, college age, to be able to rally together around tradition and folk, to be able to advocate for our own best interests. I'm also a member of the League of the South, which is a secessionist organization. Um, and I was the former president of the White Student Union at my school. Uh, I'm 22 years old. And really, kind of the reason I'm here is I believe that ethno-nationalists, you know, regardless of background, really can agree around some fundamental principles. I mean, like you were talking about in your introduction, that tension, is inevitable in a multiracial society. So where I come from in my perspective as also a separatist is that you're right, there cannot be equality in a multiracial system. And instead of having to try and go against the laws of God and nature to try and force equality, it's much better I think for the white community but then also the black community to be able to peacefully separate. You know, no one gets more resources than another. It's a fair separation. And what that would do is, you know, incidents of police brutality, um, the, uh, the industrial prison system, which, you know, primarily disaffects uh, black males, that wouldn't be a problem anymore because the black community would be able to have its own prison system, its own police, its own justice system. So we would really solve the racism problem, you know, just by peacefully separating. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from and really trying to be a voice of ecumenicalism to different racial nationalists and trying to inspire tradition and uh, pride within the white youth. Okay. So, what, explain to the audience 
What is white nationalism to you? Well, white nationalism is the push towards creating our own country. That, you know, since the beginning, that whites in this country have not had our own country. It's been a multiracial uh, society from the beginning. And I believe that that violates uh, the laws of God and also the laws of man. That multiracial empires and countries inevitably have tension. They inevitably have conflict. So the idea of being a white nationalist is that we as a people, you know, the way to be able to solve all of our racial tension problems is to be able to peacefully separate, to create our own homeland on the North American continent. Okay, so now uh, paint a picture for me. How would that look in this country? Where do you get a certain amount of states and we get a certain amount of states? So how does that work? Yeah, I mean, basically the idea that, that I would uh, make is that, first of all, the idea that we don't move any indigenous populations that are already there. So we would create a new state, um, primarily for whites or blacks, and then offer financial or tax credits for people to be able to move to their own homeland, but as not to displace any people that, you know, for instance, I'm a southerner, my town is 95% white, but 5% of the population is black, and they've been there, some of them, for 400 years. So it would be wrong of me to ask them to move, but offer gentle uh, tax incentives to have whites move out of black areas, blacks move out of white areas, things like that. So I would say there should definitely be um, areas, especially the southwest, uh, really belongs to Hispanics. They've demographically displaced both whites and blacks from that area. So that seems like a natural home for them. And then uh, the white and black community should be able to come together and find areas where you know, everyone has an equal share of resources, that you know, no one's being put in, in a situation like the reservation system where you get the worst land, but where we can peacefully coexist as separate peoples. Hmm. So are, you, are Europeans indigenous to this land? Well, there, I mean, there is a, a real question on that in regards to, you can look at the Kennewick Man, you can really look at a lot of archaeological evidence that says, at the very least, that Europeans were on this continent um, for over 10,000 years. So, you know... I mean America. Well, that, that, that's what I'm saying. That, um, you know, it, it's hard to look at the Kennewick Man, which, who, who is a European, and, and other archaeological finds, like the Clovis Points, that indicate that, that Europeans from the Caucasus might have crossed over and been living side by side with what we refer to as traditional Native Americans. Um, so, hmm. you know, if, if that is true, then we, to a certain extent, are indigenous. Hmm. You said might. Might. And, that, and that's the thing that, unfortunately, due to political correctness, that a lot of these archaeological finds are not allowed to be properly explored and not even allowed to be talked about because it disrupts the narrative of the establishment. So one of the things that I would push for is to be able to, you know, be able to have archaeological and historical inquiry into the past because the truth shouldn't be scary. The truth should set us free. So I, I think that's something that should also be pushed for. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I, from my uh, view of this, from what I've seen in history, the history books, that is, that we were given in school, I thought that uh, Christopher Columbus came here and a, as a matter of fact didn't even know where the hell he was <laughs> thought he was in another place and he uh, as far as I know Europeans came to this land and someone was already here in which we call the uh, Indian and some historians have said uh, that the Moors were here, or Black or Moor, or something like that. They were already here on this particular land. As a matter of fact, I know that uh, the Cherokee blood that runs through my veins, the Cherokees were already here. We had already instituted this land and already had um, navigated the land. We basically owned this land, and then your people came to the land. That is fact, according to the books that... Uh, we had to, we were forced to read in school, U.S. history, it's in the books, that someone was already here. Well, and then, also, that uh, Europeans went to a land that we call the motherland, or some people call Africa, which is incorrect because Scipio Africanus is the European in which the land was named after, because they had conquered that region. So Africa is not even a proper name. If we look at some of our scholars, we've been, our black scholars, like Dr. John Henry Clark, the name of what we know of today as Africa or the motherland is Akibulan. And some would say it was Ethiopia, which is the first place named in the so-called Bible that we have been given after it was taken from us 
and translated into so-called English when a whole lot of information was misused and misinterpreted when it was given back to us. Uh, so we were already here and the fully established before you all came here and started to slaughter us. That's on the books. Well, what I would say is, first of all, uh, history books are, are far from the truth. They push a political agenda. Second of all, I mean, you look at uh, the Viking establishments of Vinland, um, you know, and what we now know as Canada. That they, were, they were fully functioning white settlements that didn't displace anybody here in the North American continent prior to Christopher Columbus. But, you know, I, I think one of the main issues we need to see is, unfortunately, we can't turn back the clock. Have Europeans done things that I'm not proud of? Yes. Has every group of people on this planet done things that they're probably not proud of? Of course. And you know, the problem is, being sinful creatures, that um, we have a sin nature. And people have done things that are wrong. But we can't be looking back towards the past. I love tradition. I do more than anything. But we need to be looking, in 2013, where are we going from here? And do, do I, I feel bad about some of the things in regards to demographic displacement of the Native Americans? Yes. But at the same token, we should take the lesson of what things like unchecked immigration and what trying to live in a multiracial society will do. The Native Americans have taught us what happens when you try and live in a multiracial society and you try and compromise and you try to make promises and you trust the other party to keep their word. So, you know, do I apologize that my ancestors broke their word? Of course. But I'm also not going to make the same mistake that the Native Americans did by trusting other groups of people with their own destiny. So that's where I think in 2013, we need to learn from the lessons of the past and look towards the future, towards where every ethnic group should be able to have the ability to fulfill its own destiny. And how are we going to go about doing that? You know, we, we can't trap ourselves in what people did four or 500 years ago because you know, my, some of my ancestors are Irish. And if I continue to hold that hatred towards the English who occupied and forced slavery upon the Irish, who you know, have occupied and taken the sovereignty of the Irish people for 800 years, you know, I, I would be angry, but I, I can't be productive if, the, if hatred of what happened in the past holds me back. I need to be looking towards the future for my people and not looking backwards. And I think ethno-nationalists can understand our history, understand where we came from, but should all be working towards a better future for every single group of people on this planet. Okay. Okay. Do you believe that uh, every man on this planet should have a right to protect their children and their women? Of course. That's a biblical right. Biblical right. I agree. Let me say something to you. Now, you say past. It's past. It's past. It's these things were way back when. They don't exist at this point. But September 11th, here in the surrounding area of Chicago, Northbrook, there was a, I'll say, indigenous female. Indigenous, for those that don't know, means I would say that I'll use that word, the incorrect word, to replace what they have said as black. She was walking through a, an, an all white or European neighborhood. She's a nurse. And there was a European male on his porch. 46 years old, and he hollered out to her, and he said, hey you, I'm a paraphrase, hey you black nigga B, how does it feel to be in an all white neighborhood? And she said, I'm not from around here. And so, <laughs> and so he began to chase her, he jumped off his porch and he ran after her, and he tried to grab her. And then he told her, she, she was able to get away, thank goodness, but he told her, the next time I catch you in this neighborhood, I'm going to rape you, and I'm going to hang you from a tree. And uh, the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in this country, if I read the information correctly, I know I can know how to read and comprehend pretty well, has told this woman, it said in the report that someone has to tell this woman why the Supreme Court, which is a court that has been predominantly ran by Europeans ever since it's been instituted, Europeans have been the majority rule on that nine member board. They have said that there's no such thing at this point in time as racism. 
So there's no recourse for her in the law, the highest part in this country as far as the law goes, as far as the courts go. Now, what would you say as a white nationalist to someone like me about that situation? Because I feel that we have the right as men, as you just said, I agree, God-given right, a, a right given to us by Yah to protect our women. Well, what I would say is, you know, you look at a recent conviction in Florida in which a black male accosted a white female and uh, demanded her money and she handed it over and it wasn't enough and he shot her six-month-old baby in the head. You also look at Chris Lane, who was a promising baseball player, and a group of young black men shot him and executed him. And the reason they gave is because they were bored. So, I mean, I think you look at the system that we have of racial violence, white against black, black against white, then this is the symptom of a multiracial society. So I fundamentally agree that every single group of people has a right to be able to defend their women, defend their children, defend their homes. But the problem is, there is, for every example of white-on-black violence, I can come back with black-on-white violence. So it's an unfortunate symptom of this multicultural society. And the best way to be able to protect your women, and the best way for me to be able to protect mine, protect our children, allow our people to reach our full destiny, is to be able to peacefully separate. Because unfortunately, it's part of the human condition that God wanted us to be separate. And when we decide to go against his law, it causes conflict. Hmm. People die. People suffer. You say God wanted us to be separated. 100% believe that. That's biblical. Yep. Hmm. I, I, I can agree with that. But I truly don't agree with, the, with what you said in reference to uh, you can go basically and, and come up with a situation equivalent to uh, what we suffer in this country for every case of white on black hate crimes or whatever you want to call it, you can come back with something in, in, in reference to that as far as the vice versa of that situation. I don't agree with that, but anyway, I'm not even going to argue with that particular point. But uh, I do believe and I do know that uh, if we're talking about biblical things, that you do you believe that you reap what you sow? 100%. Huh. This country has dropped bombs all over the globe. So I know there's no way possible you can come up with something to say that that's equivalent to, you know, uh, we have done you all just as much as you've done. No, impossible. But anyway, you drop bombs all over the globe, killing men, women, and children who just want to survive. I know. I was there in uh, Saudi Arabia in the first Gulf War, and I sat there, and I remember watching this family of people in whom I was told by this government under that under uh, George Bush Sr.'s rule at that particular point in time that these individuals were our enemies. So I'm sitting here in a land which I've never seen before with people around people I've never seen before in my life and I'm watching these people inside this little their, their house and the house was, it was like it was like cloth like this you know and it was like uh, they had a little room section off, whatever. I couldn't make out the language, but I heard them laughing and intermingling them among themselves. These people had nothing to do with anything that the government under the European rule had said they'd done. And we find out now that even the things that they told us they did was not really true. There's no really no way to prove that. It seemed like there was another motive of the European. And every time you look into the European's history, it's very bloody. Bloody. Even they... they when they introduce themselves, when they speak to each other, sometimes they say, bloody, bloody good day, old chap. What the hell is that? I mean, how do you, how do you introduce yourself to, your, to the person that is, is, is a counter person to you or your friend or whatever in the morning when you greet each other, you say bloody. But this, this whole mentality of blood and guts and destruction has what, is what the European has put up on every person of color on the planet, all over the globe, just countless murders. So that's why I asked you the question, do you believe that you have to, in a biblical sense, reap what you sow? And you said yes, and therefore, it is impossible for us to just throw away what was done in the past. 
Because even if we as so-called black or indigenous people do not handle it ourselves, the almighty Yah will handle it. This is why we have storms in areas that are predominantly European that come constantly. We just had the boardwalk destroyed down there again. And so they came out and they said, okay, the news media said, finally, that maybe there's a force stronger than us. And that's exactly what it is. There is a force now in the world that is going to make the European pay for what they've done. There's no way to throw it all out. We just can't do that. I don't believe that the almighty creator is going to allow you all to skate by. Because the things that you've done, I don't think in history, no man has killed more people and destroyed more families and separated and divided more than the European has. I just don't see it. So therefore, well, what I would you say must pay. Well, what I would say to that is, first of all, you're right. Has the United States government engaged in a war across the entire planet, occupying now over 150 countries? Yes. The United States government is not my government. That the United States government does not represent the best interests of Europeans or whites. I would consider us to be currently living under a Zionist occupied government. And I see the international Jewry, I see organized banking cartels as being whites at the most can reach mid-level management or enforcers. We're, we're not the top decision makers. We're not the ones that push us into wars. You look at the First and Second World War, fratricidal conflicts that killed tens of millions of whites, us killing each other so a few banking families can make a few billion more dollars or pounds or Reichsmarks. So I think finally the problem with your assessment is that we are not controlling our own destiny, that whites, Europeans, for centuries now have not been able to control our own destiny, and that is because we are following the false god of profit, that we put money ahead of race. I mean, you look back throughout European history over the past thousand years, the Byzantine Empire specifically banned Jews from banking, from the mass media, for a reason. They understood the influence they would have over politics, or the amount of power that the coin has over changing the minds and hearts of men. And what happened? The gates of Constantinople were opened, and one of the greatest European cities fell to the Muslim invaders because a small group of Jews decided that it was time for a regime change. So I would say the fundamental problem is Europeans and all the blood that's being shed around the world. You look at this Syrian conflict. It's not in the best interest of the American people to get involved in that. I stand by President Assad. He defends the Christians. He stands for his own people. But the international influences, I was just watching recently, a uh, former retired general is now coming out and saying, this conflict is to advance Israel's best interests. So we're seeing the blood of white men and the blood of indigenous people around the world is being shed not for the best interests of whites, but for a small, very elite group that runs the world affairs. Um, you know, and I really just look, you, you talk about people that, that kill. Uh, the Mongols killed millions of people. Uh, you, you look at empires throughout the globe that it's an unfortunate condition of the human nature, but I don't think Europeans are any more or any less guilty of these sins, that every group has always done this. And I understand the importance of honoring your ancestors, honoring their sacrifices, and honoring the brutality that happened to them. But my ancestors have also suffered brutality. I mean, you look, like I said, the Irish have suffered 800 years of occupation. You look at the fact that Eastern Europeans they lived under Bolshevism for a century. Before that, so many of our ancestors were fighting every single day against the Muslim invading armies who would occupy lands, who would do mass rapes, mass executions, uh, deprive our ability to even worship our God. Um, so I would say suffering, while tragic for every group of people, is an unfortunate example of sin nature. And I think our entire globe, I mean, you look what happened, we recently, within the past couple of years, have had a tsunami that killed millions of people. You look at what happened in Haiti. You look at what I see as God's judgment falling not on a specific group of people, but God's judgment coming on a very sinful world that has entirely turned away from him and has turned towards self, has turned towards money, turned towards profit, you know, torn families apart and spit on his law. So I see us coming into an age of where every group is going to be punished because mankind is gonna reap what it sows. And we have sowed a lot of sin and a lot of hatred for centuries. So the bill is coming due, but that is not only a European condition, that is every group of people. You look at the rise in storms, earthquakes, things like that. 
It's not only in white countries. It's happening in black countries. It's happening in Asian countries. It's happening in Hispanic countries. Fires, floods, things like that. Um, I just see that as God's judgment coming on mankind, not on a specific group. Hmm. Well, I'm talking about basically when I talk about storms, I'm talking about here in the United States of America. Usually the tornadoes, the, the F5s and things of that nature hit areas where Europeans are. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Well, a lot of black folks don't live in Nebraska. So, I mean, I, I can guarantee you that if a large black population moved to the Midwest, the storms would keep coming. That's just a natural amount of the environment. But, you know, it, it, it is unfortunate and tragic, but every group of people is suffering. You know, you look at the storms that were happening in New York and New Jersey. There are a lot of black folks up there, but they were suffering right alongside white folks. That's just, I think, a problem of this broken world, a fallen nature, a sin nature has poisoned this world ever since the fall. And because of that, mankind must suffer. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay, I'm going to allow uh, the callers to chime in. Go ahead, caller. First caller, go ahead, speak. Yes, I just had a quick comment for the guest. Um, he was making it seem, or at least what I got, is that uh, a white separatist society will somehow make it just a wonderful, glorious place for white people. But that still doesn't answer the class divide that does exist amongst whites. I mean, even if all whites were to live in just one separate area, does he believe that people like the Kennedys would actually have something to do with white people who live in trailer homes? I mean, the white people that are so-called uh, considered, I guess what they call each other, white trash, would never be seen hanging out with the Bill Gates of the world. So I just want to let him know that even if he were to get on a white separatist society and that whole thing would happen, uh, some whites still are not going to want to have anything to do with other whites. There's still going to be oppression and prejudice in some form or fashion. So I think he really needs to rethink what he's talking about. I mean, that's just human nature. It has nothing to do with being racial. It's a class divide. And blacks are not your problem. Uh, since you read the Bible, understand that the sin nature is your problem, not black people. Thank you. Well, you know, what I would say to that and I think class is a very big deal. And that's why I think the proper government um, that Europeans have lived under for centuries and given to us, you look, when the Israelites turned away from having a, a theocracy, only going directly to God for government, um, the government he gave the people was a monarchy. And so I personally believe that the best system that could be developed is a monarchy, a Christian monarchy, as the Byzantine Empire had, where it's a double-headed eagle, where church and state are intimately linked where there's a monarchy and there's this idea of noblesse oblige where the elites there will always be rich there will always be elites